costume design is really about answering the questions, who, what, where, how, and why. After I got my PhD, my, my advisor said, okay, Deborah, the shelf is empty, now fill it. What moves me is the recognition and recognized value for costume designers. Deborah Nedulman Landis is a double source of inspiration. First, as a costume designer, having created iconic costumes such as The Blues Brothers, Indiana Jones, Michael Jackson's red outfit in Thriller, and second, as a professor and costume expert, Deborah Landis being the director of the David C. Copley Center for Costume Design at UCLA and the author of essential books about costume design. Therefore, I'm doubly excited to have you as my guest for Profession Costumière, Deborah. Welcome. Merci beaucoup. So first, I'd like to discuss your early career as a costume designer and ask you how you became a costume designer. What led you to this profession? I, I think I was born this way. I, I really believe that, um, that, well, and as a parent of two children, I, I not only believe it, but I witnessed it, that some people are born with um, a natural affinity to uh, to subjects and to things and I you, there's no reason for it sometimes I guess you inherit a gene which makes you more musical or makes you more artistic or makes you better at, at mathematics that was certainly true of my brother who was a prodigy a math prodigy so I I was born with an inclination toward um, toward costuming and it's an interesting thing because Early on, early on, you can really feel the difference between fashion and costuming. Mm. I was never that interested in fashion per se. I was interested in dressing up and being part of a story and creating a story. I did learn everything um, about the handicrafts for my grandmother. And I think this is a This is something that many fashion designers and many costume designers and people interested in costume can relate to because it did skip a generation. My mother was a professional. She was a teacher of the deaf and she um, she was not interested in anything having to do with the hands. Mm. But my grandmother, who had been uh, had gone to college, had become a pharmacist. I sat between my grandmother's legs And she, sh she, I helped her sew at her machine from the time I was about four years old. I had my little hands on that <laughs> machine. When I could hold knitting needles, my grandmother taught me how to knit. Because I was interested, I had the inclination. So my hands were always busy. My hands are still always busy. I'm always doing needlepoint or something with my hands, right? So this was from birth. Then as I was growing up in school, of course, I was the first one to say, oh, I'll make the costumes for the school <laughs> play. In the, in the summers, I went to camp. Oh, I'll, I'll make the costumes in camp. We always had shows in camp. So I never thought about it. I was drawn to it. It was a magnet for me. I needed it. And as I went through high school, I became more and more drawn to history. It's interesting. I was very good in school at literature, mm -hmm. but it was history that captured my imagination because I never saw a difference between the people in the books and us. Mm. I could draw a line. And in fact, it always hurt me when I heard friends say, history is so boring. And I thought, history is alive. History is not boring. <laughs> Let me make all these clothes for, for this story. Mm. And we'll put on a show with this story. And you will be able to see how exciting and macabre and fantastic and romantic this story is. So when I went to college, when I firmly first got to college or university, I went as a history major and then quickly changed into theater to be a theater major 
And then by the time I was 20, I enrolled at UCLA. It's very ironic. <laughs> I enrolled at UCLA to get very far from my parents in New York. And I, I enrolled in U, at UCLA for a um, degree in costume design. That's the story of my life. <laughs> um, and then to move a little uh, in time, uh, you, when you were in LA, I think you met uh, director John Landis, who also became your husband. Yes, I mean, it wasn't, it, I didn't meet him working on a movie at all. Mm. I, he was the, he was a friend of my first boyfriend when I was 18 years old. I had a boyfriend at college in Vermont who went to, not to high school, but well, I guess to high school with John. John only went to one year of high school. He became friends with John. He went to junior high school and high school with John and this boyfriend Sadly, I don't know what you call it in French, but he dumped me. He dumped mm. me. <laughs> so sorry. My boyfriend dumped me. I was madly in love, but he dumped me. And he said, you know, why don't you go to California and get out of Vermont and meet and go and see my parents and go and see my friend John Landis. So I, I met John when I was 18 and he was 20. And so <clears throat> we weren't we weren't together then but mm. we became friends then so we were we were friends for five years by the time we got together and then you collaborated on many great projects together uh, um, yes among which uh, the very famous blues brothers and also thriller uh, michael jackson's 30 minutes video clip um, so i was wondering if you could tell us about the creative process for the iconic costumes of the two main characters in the blues brothers for instance i heard in one of your interviews that you were inspired by another iconic comic duo uh, laurel and hardy that's true that's true well <laughs> laurel and hardy are john's my husband's favorites mm. and i would like to say that when laurel and hardy are on television everything stops in our house <laughs> and we have to watch laurel and hardy again it's imprinted on me somehow <laughs> So I made, we made two movies before the Blues Brothers. We made a uh, Kentucky Fried Movie and Animal House. And mm -hmm. I made, um, before the Blues Brothers, I designed 1941 for Steven Spielberg. And then immediately after the Blues Brothers, I went from the Blues Brothers to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Right? Yes. So, so it was a very intense working time for me. I guess. Uh, what happens on a film for all costume designers, so if you can see my, my career, my early career in my 20s, I, I read the script for the Kentucky Fried movie and designed it for very little budget. Mm -hmm. Then I read the script for Animal House, designed it for very little budget. Then I read the script for 1941, which was a huge budget at the time. It was about $25 million at the time, mm. which was crazy for Steven Spielberg. And then, and then I went to the Blues Brothers. And the reason that Steven Spielberg is at the end of the Blues Brothers is that I had worked with him and became friends with him on 1941. Mm. So the Blues Brothers is actually a sandwich between two Spielberg movies, right? Yes. So when I first met John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd, they had already developed those costumes mm. on Saturday Night Live and had been playing the Blues Brothers for a few years. The difference, um, really the difference between what they put together and then what I put together and the ultimately the clothes for the Blues Brothers film was that I recognized that they had a unique silhouette and that Danny Aykroyd at the time was very tall and very slim and that John was not very tall and not very slim. And there was an opportunity to create a very, very strong silhouette. And I think that silhouette, looking back on my career, silhouette is um, a big contribution that I think I have made ultimately to 
to the conversation around costume design, mm. these notions of color, silhouette, and 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 texture, because previously I don't think there was language around that, but silhouette is incredibly important in the frame. Now you and I are looking at each other on Zoom, and you can see my silhouette quite clearly because I'm wearing a black sweater. Well, in a movie, you have Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi, and wherever they go in that movie, you can see them in the center of the frame, silhouetted in their hats, their white shirts, <clears throat> and their black jackets. So that was incredibly important. And yes, in the same way that you can tell Laurel and Hardy from their silhouette with their silly hats, you can tell the Blues Brothers in the mm. frame, in silhouette, no matter where they are on this planet Earth. The second thing I did for, for the Blues Brothers was my husband, John, who was directing the film, did not want, did not want them ever to appear dirty. Hmm. So a lot happens in the yes. movie. <laughs> but somehow, Jake and Elwood always looked like they just came from the dry cleaners True. because they um it doesn't matter what happens around them the explosion they fall down they're in a fight and they always look perfect because because john landis wanted them to look attractive mm. he never wanted them to look like in Animal House, John Belushi's character, Bluto, with food on his chest and <laughs> disgusting. In a way, they kind of look elegant. Yes. All right? They kind of look cool and elegant. And, and that was also, um, that wasn't accidental or casual. They, they had to look attractive. And I've really tried to do that in my costuming because, because it's our job as costume designers to help the audience connect and engage with the people in the story. So either, either you wanna be with them or you wanna be them. And after the movie came out, of course it transformed Halloween because every, man, because every man could find a hat, a jacket. Now, John and Danny, when they were on Saturday Night Live, they found any jacket, any pair of black pants, any hat, and any glasses. When it came to the movie, I said, okay, well, we're going to make this a uniform. Mm. And it's going to be a uniform. It's going to be elegant. You never have to think about it. We have to believe that both Jake and Elwood have a closet of matching black jackets and matching black hats. And then if you looked at their, their closet, it would all be hats, jackets, all right, white shirts. So I said, let's, let's make it again. The idea from me is that it'd be very flattering that they look great. Mm. So I made all of their suits at Universal Studios. I had a wonderful tailor named Tommy. And Tommy created suits for Dan Aykroyd, for, uh, for um, Elwood, that were very long and narrow, three buttons, right? And I made the hats in Ohio, Dobbs hats. I made all of the shirts and all of the ties. And it was clean, clean, refined, made from very good lightweight wool and it was not it's not a casual throw on a jacket it's an mm. elegant piece of you could say couture right for jake two button jacket so you create a very long lapel line it was more flattering for john belushi and everything the same right and i i just feel like it was incredibly important for them to to be attractive and to mm. be I, I don't know about sexy but rom certainly romantic yes and there was a love story between jake and carrie fisher you know that love story <laughs> and so you had to 
if he was covered with dirt or had anything from, you know, it would it would not have been possible. Mm. He had to look dashing. He had to look. Um, he had to look masculine. He had to look dashing. He had to look attractive. He had to look. I don't know, like Gary Cooper, but John Belushi. Mm. <laughs> and the movie also casts uh, tremendous music stars such as James Brown, Aretha Franklin, and Ray Charles. So, how was it designing costumes for uh, such icons? It was fant fantastic, and I loved working with Aretha. I worked with Aretha twice on the Blues Brothers and then on Blues Brothers 2000. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I, I made that uh, pink uniform for her, the pink waitress uniform. And again, in terms of costume design, I'm, I'm sure anybody listening will understand why I put her in that sleeveless men's vest. She's in a long vest. Mm. Well, to make her look slimmer, right? So I, I, I put her in that, and I, I, once, once you do that, you just see that uh, vertical line down mm -hmm. the front. And then I had an idea of putting her in slippers, so she's wearing house slippers. And there's, there's a picture of me on the set that I can send to you. Oh, yes, I'd love to see it. <laughs> of me making her apron dirty. And she, she was a pleasure. Um, I have to say that when I first met her, the very first time I met Aretha Franklin, I went, to, she was recording an album and I went to see her, ter I was terrified. Mm. And she was wearing four inch pink heels, right? Yes. High heels, four inch. And she was wearing a hot pink unitard unitard mm. one piece unitard wow <laughs> wow with spaghetti straps and otherwise naked i mean just spaghetti straps this hot pink spandex unitard <laughs> and four inch heels and i just thought i wish i had the confidence of this woman oh my god mm. i'm very covered up i'm a very i'm dressed very modestly And I just walked into that room and I was just blown away. And mm -hmm. yes, and I, uh, and I costumed, I mean, who wouldn't love to, co I mean, I, I couldn't believe that I was with Ray Charles and with James Brown. And they were wonderful to me and wonderful men. And we did fittings and tried them on because, of course, everyone in a movie is dressed Because they can, no one, even in a contemporary film, no one wears their own clothes because they have to fit into the narrative of the mm. film. They can't stick out. They, he really has to be a, a, the Ray of Ray's music exchange, right? So I can't have him be Ray Charles who lives in a mansion in Los Angeles. So he had to come down to Chicago mm. to really be that person. So um, costuming is transformation mm. and I loved working with these the the gods and goddesses of the blues mm. it's incredible I I, I cherish the, those memories mm. I guess so I will love to see the picture of you uh, with Aretha Franklin <laughs> I look very different <laughs> I'm sure you don't. Uh, in 1993, you designed the costumes for the 13 minutes video um, thriller where Michael Jackson wears a now cult uh, red leather jacket, a magic pair of jeans and his signature white socks with Lothers, an homage to Fred Astaire. Uh, and this silhouette became one of his most iconic. So could you tell us about uh, its creation? And of course, the thriller movie was also directed by uh, John Landis. Yes. Well, again, I teach costume design and I've taught at the American Film Institute where I teach every year and I teach at UCLA and I also have taught at USC. And 20 years ago, a student at USC came down to the front of the class and he said to me, Professor Landis, I, I can't take this class. And I looked at him and I said, why, why can't you take it? And he said, well, because I can't sew. This is a filmmaker. 
And I responded, do you see any sewing machines? No. And my response was, can you read? Hmm. He said, yes, I can read. I said, well, costume designers, first and foremost, are readers and interpreters of the screenplay, of the script. Have you written a script? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I had screenwriting. I, I wrote a script. Well, my job as a costume designer is to help you bring the people in the screenplay to life. Mm. Oh, and he went back and sat down because every filmmaker wants to bring the people in the screenplay to life. So Celeste, with Thriller, John and Michael had an idea and John wrote the little screenplay, right? It was very short because it was a 15 minute video. Then my, John wrote a script and then he hired all of us who worked on American Werewolf. We went from American Werewolf in London directly to Thriller. So it was Rick Baker who was doing the makeup. Bob Painter was the cinematographer and I was going to be doing the costumes. I read the script, we met together. It was exactly like producing a major motion picture. Mm. So it all came from the script. The first thing that I saw was I needed a college, American college letterman jacket, right? And then I had to make the clothes for um, Ola Ray, the young woman. So I yes. made all of her clothes as well. It was just like doing a little movie. Mm. When we got to the scene um, with the red jacket, I knew that because we had discussed it at length, where are we shooting this? Where is it going to be shot? Costume design is really about answering the questions, who, what, where, how, and why. Hmm. Who, what, where, how, and why. So I saw that it was Michael. It was in a dark movie theater, then on a dark street, then with zombies, and all in gray and and shades of gray, really, almost in a like from a black and white movie. So shades of gray and brown. And in many ways, design is reductive. So I thought about what color could it be? Yellow, terrible. Blue, not really. Blue doesn't do anything for me. White, mm. absolutely not. I have an African-American man, absolutely not. Black, it's going to get lost. Green, not the feeling. And I, then I got very quickly to red, which, of course, felt like the devil. Red mm. and black felt like the devil. So I started talking about red and very quickly came upon an idea for a design that now when I look back on it, again, in retrospect, it feels like he's in a superhero jacket. Yes, completely. Because I increased the size of the shoulders to give him a body, again, mm. silhouette. How do I make this tiny little person tiny little person, very short, so slim. How do I make him bigger? How do I mm. increase his machismo? And how do I make him um, look, um, look important, mm. look strong? I didn't have to do, he was a genius. Michael Jackson was a genius. There is no doubt. I didn't have to add, you couldn't add talent, but I did want everyone to see him mm. and everyone to be impressed by him in the darkness. And I had to pick a color that wouldn't overwhelm his skin tone or his face, something that, that he would wear and that wouldn't wear him, right? Mm. Not so yes. much of a costume that you were looking at the costume. And then in terms of the V, I really created that on, a, on the um, cutting table because I was working at a leather manufacturer's and looking at the pattern on the cutting table, again, I was thinking, how can I give this young man, Michael, a body? I have to mm. give him a 
body. And by, by giving him this V, it was also, again, uh, very native or very intuitive to make him, it, I mean, it feels like it now when I look at it, I think of the X-Men. <laughs> you know, and this Completely, is, yes. This is so far before the X-Men, but mm. I took this V to really push out his shoulders. So that's how I created the costume. And then I saw the choreography and I, it's very often that costume designers go to see rehearsals. I went to see the choreography and the choreography was a V with Michael at the top of the V. So there you have a costume with the V and then the choreography with the V. And suddenly it became a very, very strong frame, a very strong frame. And all of this visual storytelling helps thriller. Mm. Because the, the remember, uh, Celeste, that this album had already been double platinum. Yes before the video came out mm. and then the video came out and this fantastic choreography plus the visual storytelling was so strong and that's really John Landis right um was it was so strong it became it was just irresistible Mm. And uh, last question about one of, I had to pick a few films that you made because you worked on so many and uh, I picked uh, the first Indiana Jones film, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, yes. So as you mentioned before, uh, you had already worked with Steven Spielberg on uh, 1941 and then you met again for Raiders of the uh, Lost Ark. And uh, I read uh, in one of your interviews that you actually designed the costume first for uh, Tom Selleck. And right. then he couldn't play the part and this very now famous uh, costume uh, was worn by uh, Harrison Ford. So could you tell us a bit about this experience and designing this costume? And then the, the character uh, went on for uh, several other movies. So you really designed uh, his, uh, his character. Yes, uh, it's, it's all true. I, I found out much later, 30 years later, that fantastic storyboards had been created for this character uh, a year or two before, before I designed the film. Mm -hmm. But I never saw the storyboards. And they look like Indiana Jones, but they are, they're not warm and they're mm -hmm. not vulnerable. And they certainly don't have any sense of humor. Harrison Ford brought all of those things. Mm -hmm. They brought it. it his intelligence, his, um, well, then his humility, <laughs> his modesty, his sense of humor. He brought all of that to Indiana Jones. I wouldn't, I couldn't say really what it would have been like for Tom Selleck. Mm. But when I started on the film, I started on the film here in Los Angeles. And I have a wonderful drawing of Indiana Jones by Steven Spielberg that I can send you to put up with your podcast. Oh, yes. Thank because I, I asked him what Indy should look like. And Steven and I were very close then, and he drew this picture on my drawing pad. <laughs> so I will send it to you. Thank so you. So he had a very clear vision. Well, it, it was not unique. It mm. was not unique. There are two other films, at least, or three other films that I can think of where the star is wearing exactly yes. the same costume. <laughs> okay. So Charlton Heston twice in Lost Treasure of the Incas, which is 1952 and almost exactly Raiders of the Lost Ark. Raiders mm. of the Lost Ark is almost a remake of that movie. Then there's Greatest Show on Earth, which is a little bit earlier. Also Charlton Heston, also in a brown fedora mm -hmm. and, a, and a brown leather jacket. And also Alan Ladd was in several movies with a, a brown fedora. And so I, I don't want to say that I, I created the archetype. The archetype all was already there. But I did create the entire, what should I say, the essence Mm. of who Indiana Jones would be. And if you believe, as I do, that 
and as Martin Scorsese does, <laughs> that costume is the character, that we essentially are who we wear. Then I have to say that my collaboration with Harrison helped create who that person became. Mm. And again, it wasn't any jacket. It wasn't any hat. It wasn't any trousers or shoes. It was greater than the sum of its parts. For instance, the jacket had to fit. I had to, you had to zip the jacket where I decided that it would look so much better if Harrison could keep his jacket zipped and close to his body and still use his whip. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the back of the jacket, there's a very deep, what we call a vent. There's mm -hmm. a very deep vent so that he has lots of room to stretch his shoulders. Freedom of movement. Freedom of movement. So that's not something you're going to find in a store. Mm. And then, of course, I made all these jackets in London at Berman's and Nathan's Costume House, no longer exist. And I aged the first one myself because, of course, again, the audience is not supposed to notice But this is a man, Indiana Jones, who lives in his clothes. He sleeps in his clothes. Mm. He takes off his jacket. He rolls it up. He puts it under his head. He sleeps in the desert. The color had to be, had to be brown because he is a man of the soil, a man of the earth. He's an archaeologist. Mm. And again, when you see him at university, he's kind of elegant and cares about how yes. he looks. The hat I created for him, because it's not just any hat. The crown had to be made shorter because Harrison's face is very long. I had to make the brim shorter because the cinematographer had to see his face uh, underneath the lights. So every single, every single element is customized for that actor to make the performance greater. Mm. And, and I, I don't believe that, generally speaking, the audience really understands that costume design and performance are completely linked on a, uh, on a, on a real, you know, genetic level mm. that, that actors become someone else using that costume as the bridge, as the, as the midwife to, to transform into this completely other person. There are elements of... Indiana Jones in Harrison Ford, but Harrison Ford is not Indiana Jones. Mm. I had a few questions about uh, your work as a costume expert uh, also. Yeah. So to briefly explain, uh, after a very rich career in uh, as a costume designer, you also needed to settle down for personal reasons and went on with the second and equally exciting part of your career uh, that I will call costume historian slash professor slash expert. Uh, you have a PhD uh, in history of design and I saw that you wrote the first doctoral dissertation in the film of uh, costume design and you have published six books uh, about costume design and have been working on an encyclopedia in three volumes as uh, a Bloomsbury encyclopedia in film and television costume which is currently in press and which is such an exciting project and um, so many things you're doing right now but you're also the director of David C. Coplicher in costume design at the UCLA. <laughs> Um, so I was wondering, as a teacher, as a costume design teacher, uh, what motivates you most? That's a huge question, Celeste. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what motivates me? Well, I have a passion for all clothes. And I could say that there is nothing about dress that doesn't interest me. Mm. So that's a, a double negative in English means a positive. So I'm, I'm interested in lace and lace making. I'm interested in embroidery. I'm interested in knitting. I'm interested in African diasporic fashion. I'm interested in French couture. I'm interested in 
Mesoamerican archaeological textiles. I'm interested in all of it. However, costume design in particular has been marginalized mm. in the motion picture and television industry since the very beginning. And of all my interest, the understanding and the value that costume design has created for not only the studios, but for international popular culture is, has been inestimable. And no one knows the names of those designers. Mm. So it's very common for fashion designers to say, oh, uh, when I was growing up, I was so inspired by Bonnie and Clyde, or I was so inspired by Funny Girl, or I was so inspired by Top Hat, Fred, Fred Astier and Ginger Rogers. Mm. And somehow they were inspired by the films, those fashion designers and the general public, but they didn't know that, or they're not aware mm. that it was the costume designer who helped create those people. The people that the audience falls madly in love with. And I believe it's because the studios hid that information. They kept that information because they own everything, mm. right? The costume designers have no labels. So Celeste, if you went to Paramount and or to Lucasfilm and you looked at all of Harrison Ford's jackets for Raiders of the Lost Ark, you would not see my label in those jackets or in anything that I designed. So among my colleagues and those great colleagues that came before me, that recognition has never been there. Few people win the Oscar. Few people have recognition, and mostly for costumes that look like costumes, mm, period. Period costume. films, yes. So my feeling is what moves me, other than this passion for, for textiles and dress, is the recognition and recognized value mm. for costume designers. Fashion is a completely different thing with a completely different reason. Mm. I absolutely adore it, but it's not what we do. We collaborate on stories and the people in the story have to be right for that moment. And we never know whether what we create will be around in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years. And look at my work now in mm. four years. I did my job. I read the script. I spoke to the director. I worked with the actor. And every job I do is exactly the same. Right? And then mm. later, I'm absolutely amazed that what I have created in my, in my lifetime, but also in collaboration with my creative collaborators has stood this test of time. Mm. So many people, Celeste, have asked me um, whether I knew that Indiana Jones or Michael Jackson's thriller would be so iconic. They say, oh, you must have known. Oh, you must have known. Absolutely mm. not, because we do, we, we have a prescribed working process that's always the same. So marginalized because of women's work, mostly mm. done by women. It's clothing, so people don't credit it, neither directors or producers or the studio. It's just clothes. Later on, Maybe they'll recognize it when it's 50 years and that and that jacket is still around. And I actually, I was wondering if as a writer on costume design, were you first struck at the lack of writing about costume design when you <laughs> <laughs> compared, yeah, <laughs> compared to other movie fields? I mean, well, when I when I got my my PhD, I my supervisor, my After I got my PhD, my, my advisor said, okay, Deborah, 
the shelf is empty. Now fill it. Mm. And thank you so much for filling it. Well, the encyclopedia should be wonderful because I hope it will include many, 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 many French films and French costume designers as well. It's a global encyclopedia. Mm. Yes, I know you've been closely yeah. working with the French Cinematheque, for instance. Yes, I mean, it, it includes, it includes um, the designers of Mexican telenovelas. Mm. So who are those people? And they create huge uh, fashion trends. Those, mm -hmm. uh, those Mexican telenovelas are popular in Egypt yes. and Saudi Arabia. Who is, who is designing those? So, yes, I'm very moved by the encyclopedia. And the encyclopedia, when it comes out in 2021, the first volume, it will be a website. Mm. And it, anyone will be able to access it. That's so exciting. I'm really looking forward to it. And last question. Uh, I was wondering, it's a large question, but is there a few movie costumes that you like the most personally and why? Do you have any favorites, personal favorites? I would rather name the designers. Yes. So, uh, I, so many of my friends acknowledge Piero Tosi. Yes. As the greatest. And I agree. Even the short time I spent with him, I, I learned so much about costume design just over lunch. So he was no slave to historicism. And he understood how valuable design was and anachronism to storytelling. Mm -hmm. So people think that he, he was a great uh, period designer, but in fact, he changed everything everything for his vision. So mm. I loved him. I'm very moved by Anthony Powell's work. Yes. I'm very moved by Milena Cananero's work. I had a mentor, Theodore Van Ronkel, who designed Bonnie and Clyde. Yes. <laughs> and I once went into a Kate Spade store and Bonnie and Clyde was, was running on, they had, they had a very big monitor and Bonnie and Clyde was running on the monitor And I asked to speak to the manager. And I said to the manager, um, Kate Spade is using Bonnie and Clyde as an inspiration for her line. Who, who was the costume designer? And that was very bad of me, of course, because the manager of the shop had no, had idea. no idea, I guess. Yes. <laughs> But it was Theodore Van Runkel. So mm. I have to say Theodore Van Runkel also designed Godfather II. I have to say, those are my favorites, but I, I have a long list of favorites. I mean, Anna Hill Johnston, Anne Roth, there are many, many. I'd like to thank Deborah Landis for sharing her experience both as a costume designer and a costume historian and teacher. If you like Profession Costumière, tell the people you love about it and don't forget to give it five stars on your podcast app. You can also join the podcast on Instagram at Profession Costumière. See you soon. Bye.